everybody, I'm Bree the Plant Lady, and today I am visiting Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm visiting a garden for the first time that I've always wanted to visit. And you invited me like over a year ago. Well, welcome. <gasps> Thank you. And I'm Tom Nunn Camp, and the garden is Maple Walk. And my wife, Liv Jones, and I have been uh, working on this project for about 30 years. Uh, it's comprised of three properties. We garden about two and a quarter acres. Uh, one of the properties actually had a house on it, and we took the house down to make more garden. And our neighbors, of course, thought we were crazy, and they were probably right. Uh, so the uh, Bree and I are gonna be walking around. Uh, the reason it's called Maple Walk is we have 97 different Japanese maples. We also have 23 different dogwoods over 50 different conifers, and over 100 different camellias in the garden. So I don't know if you knew this, but we bought the house next door to us. Oh, really? And I'm about to break ground on a brand new garden there. How exciting. And the, the real plan is to buy the house behind it, and then we'll have five consecutive acres. So you're as crazy as I am. Yeah, we are kindred spirits. Yes. Yeah, there's probably a mental institution waiting for us right now. You know who else has done that? Tony Avent at Plant oh, the yes. Lights and Michael Durr yeah, from right. University of Georgia. And I don't know Michael, but I know Alan Armitage well. Yes. And uh, in fact, have traveled a bit with Alan. Oh, nice. Well, I was actually on a Zoom with Alan this morning. Oh, wow. So he's doing well. Well, if, if, if <laughs> next time you're on Zoom, tell him I said hello. I will. Uh, Susan, his wife, is a delight. Oh, she is a delight. Yeah. She's a, she's a lot better than Alan. Like that. <laughs> I would want to go on a trip with Susan, yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll turn the camera around and we'll get to show everybody your fabulous face. Oh, that'll be fun. Oh, this is so exciting. Yeah. First of all, the turf is a hybrid Bermuda. It's a golf course grass. Now this time of year, it doesn't look spectacular because we're in early November, but it's a grass called Tiff Grand. It's cut by a robot. I do the edging, uh, but I've been really pleased with it. Did you get this from Supersod? Uh, I did, except the Supersod no longer sells it. I know, they do Tiff Tough. They do Tiff instead. Tough now. And I, my neighbor next door actually has Tiff Tough and he would much rather have, have this. Grade. This is, I mean, you say it doesn't look spectacular, but it does. And I just want to show everybody, because people think that we do a good job edging in my garden. You're the best edge I've ever seen anywhere. And it has not been edged in three weeks. That is amazing. Do you have a tool? No, I use string trimmer. You use a string trimmer, okay. There you have it, everybody. If you want a crisp edge, remember, the difference between nature and a garden is an edge. <laughs> this, this is the best edge I've ever witnessed. Everybody in Charlotte, at one time or another, has taken their Fraser fir Christmas tree out in the back, stuck it in the backyard to see if it would grow, and no, it didn't grow. A number of years ago, I discovered Abies firma, the Momi fir, and it's an oriental fir, grows as far south as Alabama, and it is happy, happy, happy. Now, here's the negative to the tree. It's still a baby. Yeah. So, you better have some space when you plant Abies firma, but it's going to be a problem for somebody, but it's not going to be my problem. Well, and you know, when I worked at Camellia Forest, yes. I used to graft the other firs First onto firma, firma oh, yes. so that they could grow in the southeast. Right. So firma really is the trick for yeah. conifers in the and heat. And I've got several uh, that are grafted to firma. These blackberries, uh, asparagus, and we get none of it. Um, <laughs> uh, the critters get it all, but we continue to grow it. And you know, you're here in the city. And we have deer everywhere. I believe it. And uh, we had an eight point buck in here a couple days ago. Oh, good grief. Uh, and he was, th this time of year it's rut and they're rubbing and causing all kinds of havoc. We do a lot of spraying to discourage them. That's, yes. I mean, that's sometimes the only thing you can do. I like this guy a lot. Oh, yeah. Echinoformis juniperus communis. That is a really nice, and you probably don't do any pruning to it at all. No, I haven't done it. It is awesome. 
But wait, what is this crazy cool? This is the most, it, it <sighs> really isn't beautiful this time of year. Give the reveal. Uh, yes, <laughs> indeed, this is a ligustrum, uh, a variety called Wimbish. And uh, it, people love to look at it. And every time they say they think they want one, I tell them think twice because during growing season, it grows like a weed. This plant is less than five years old and it has to be pruned twice a week. Holy smokes. And uh, so, but it, it looks pretty spectacular. Now, ligustrums are invasive, but we don't have to worry because this one never blooms <laughs> because I'm constantly pruning it. So it's never gonna be invasive. I am not a Ligustrum fan, but I have to say this may be the coolest plant I've ever seen on planet Earth. It is <laughs> a, a interesting story about that, Brie. Uh, if you go online and look this up, this is not what you see. <laughs> However, we've had a garden designer in here a couple years ago, whose name I don't remember, who shot a 360 degree video and posted it online so this actually does show up as one of the examples of the plant wow as far as i know i'm the only crazy one that, that's doing this i think it's the coolest thing ever well i'm i'm a uh, big time pruner uh and i have the hand to prove that <laughs> i can't open my hand any farther oh, no. than that wait what's your pruner brand uh actually i um Okasumi. Me, yeah, Okasumi, that's my brand too. Yeah, I, you know, yep. And for all the people out there who love Felco, I'm sorry, but it's way too much trouble. Yes. Those gears, I want simple. Abe's Coriana. This is definitely like one of the Holy Grail conifers. I think it's a cool conifer. It's so handy that you've got these great labels. The, there's a story behind the labels. Oh. Um, like virtually every, every gardener has tried labels. We were with Alan Armitage in Nova Scotia and we were touring a private garden and they had these labels. And I asked the lady, I said, great labels, they must be new. She says, oh no, these are years old because they're stainless steel and they have a weatherproof tape on them and okay. so we so we make them and um so you can print right on the tape yes and then you just put the tape, tape on, on the stainless steel the that is awesome wow what and so then if a plant dies you can just reuse oh, yeah, it yeah we reuse them all the time that's yeah. great um is a result of that trip to durham to the pruning conference Lib hung out in Duke Gardens for three days while I attended classes and pruned. <laughs> and she saw this design, took a picture of it, and had somebody, we had somebody come in and replicate it. So this it's is- fabulous. We stole this from, uh, from Duke Gardens, you know. So and that stone the vent. Stone, the stone weighs 2,800 pounds. Uh, and it is not bolted to those stones. It is sitting on those stones and getting that level was not a uh, Not an easy thing, but I bet it's comfortable. It is and we uh, when we have groups We often take a picture of them here on the bench. The neat thing about this tree and you can look at the tag when we go by Is that it has gorgeous variegated leaves all year. I used to propagate this why don't I remember its proper name? Uh, I never can remember it. It starts with CL. Caudatifolium. Yeah. There we have it. This is this was one of my favorites. I may have actually gotten this. From Camellia Forest? Yes. So that means that I probably propagated yeah, it. Yeah, that is <laughs> it's entirely possible that's where it came from. It is such a great plant. And like you said, variegated leaves, in fact, Right here, and I love the pink petiole. Gives a little you added color. You don't see that kind of variegation very often. No, you don't. It, it's really nice. And I mean, the yellow bark mm -hmm. all winter long. It's a winner. Yeah. Uh, 
Is that Ryusin? Yeah, it is Ryusin. Oh, yeah. And um, the stones are fantastic. The, there were no boulders on the property. Uh, we have brought in, I think it's 70 tons over the years. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a bunch in here. Um, but they're in all parts of the garden. Wow. Uh, I've just missed the peak of Japanese maple. Yeah. So y'all can see there's some leaves still on, but, but they're, they're brown and crunchy now. And we, we've had like a week of rain. We had. And the... Uh, the guys from Mr. Maple were oh, here at the film. Oh, yes. And this is one of the pine bark maples. Which is the coolest. Boy, what a great example. And great to show people where it's grafted. So you can yes. see the difference between the root stock or the understock and the cyan wood. Right. And not every grafted plant is as obvious as this, right. but with the bark differentiation. And everybody, you should watch. I'll put a link to the um, YouTube video that Matt and Tim and their team put together from here. Yeah. So yeah, we'll 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 connect. We'll cross paths. Um, it swallowed this boulder, but <laughs> when I planted it, I, I thought, oh, it'll be nice, just maybe brushing the boulder. Well, that has passed. Can't go wrong with a Deodor cedar. And especially if you don't have room for it to grow up. Yes. This is a great option. Oh, it's so beautiful. This is becoming one of my favorite dogwoods. This is Little Ruby. It was developed at the North Carolina Arboretum by Tom Rainey. Uh, it is almost a cross between a tree and a bush. It's a lot denser than most dogwoods, but one of the beauties of growing it here in Charlotte is that it's semi-evergreen. It's a cross between Kusa and, uh, and uh, Hong Kong Genesis, okay. which is an evergreen dogwood. And so during the fall, as you can see, the leaves turn burgundy and about two thirds of these leaves will stay on all winter. So I'll have winter interest and then in the spring, it blooms pink. Oh, wow. So, and it is budded up. Uh, so I'm anxious to see it this spring. I haven't seen this in person. So this is very exciting. Look at every, every bud. Oh my gosh. Now this this is story insane. behind the arch is rather interesting. My wife had for a period of time, a number of years, really thought there should be something that differentiated what we call the upper garden, which we're just leaving, and we enter what we call the woodland garden. And so she, in going on different sites and looking at different things, found this arch that she liked. So she talked me into the arch and I was, less than enthusiastic but 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 it, uh, the more we got into it the more i liked the idea but we knew exactly who we wanted to do it there's a local company called the stone man and the stone man was a guy named george crump who was from the british isles and george was well known around town for building arches uh, with keystones with no more and and i had taken a class on laying dry stack stone to make stone walls from him so when we went out to see the, the initial proposal the woman who was heading up the project said i've got some interesting news and she said and i said what's that and she said well as you know my my husband's best friend is george and george is running ultra marathons in Colorado right now. And he called him on the phone and George got out of the business because he was sick of doing fire pits <laughs> and patios. He said, if I do another fire pit, I'm gonna pull my hair out. So he sold the company. So the husband's talking to George in Colorado and he said, George, we've got an arch. And he said, really? And he said, and it's for Tom Nillington. He said, I'll be back. Oh. 
Oh, that's awesome. So George came back and supervised the building of the ark. And I watched it happen on, on, in, on and, Instagram. Now, did we post the picture of George standing on top of the arch? I don't know. Well, I can easily send it to you. But after it was over, <laughs> he stood on top of the arch and we took his picture. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, what a special story. <laughs> this was a result of our trip to Durham to my, uh, my pruning convention. Uh, as my wife was hanging out in the Duke Gardens, she saw these handrails. And when we got back home, she called Duke to find out where they came from. And they are stainless steel that are sunk in two feet of concrete, covered with an epoxy to look like black walnut. Oh and my God! It's a, it's a metal sculptor in Greensboro. Yeah. This is Cornus Angustata, Empress of China, an evergreen dogwood in this climate. The leaves that you see now over the, the winter will wilt, but they'll stay green and they'll stay on the plant. In the spring, the new leaves will push them off. For us, this, if not the most floriferous, it is one of the most floriferous of all the dogwoods. It is loaded every year. You can see, even from a distance as I'm scrolling in, there are, a, there are hundreds of thousands of flower buds. Yeah, it, it is. And the, the neat thing about it is, for us, it starts blooming in early June and blooms almost the entire month. So it stays in bloom longer than most dogwoods. So there's another reason to love. And, you know, later than Florida and Coosa. Coosa. So if you get these, all these different species, you can actually have dogwoods flowering for many, many months. And something that we passed that I didn't point out, we, we didn't, our first dogwood to bloom is Cornus Max. Yes. And for us, it will start blooming probably late January, early February. So we have dogwoods blooming for February all the way through June. That's amazing. Well, and of course, camellias offer that same. Um, you get the right varieties. Yeah. You can start in August and have them all the way through yeah, May. Right have become, at least for me, almost impossible to find now. These are the Southgate series. Yes. And these were the crosses between the native rhododendron and an Alabama rhododendron to be heat tolerant. And I've had tremendous success with them. I've never lost one. No, nope. and they flower consistently. And they flower early. They f flower for me almost a month earlier. Oh, wow. And, uh, but now I can't find them anywhere. No, I mean, they came out, what, 15 years ago? And I guess they didn't have good marketing. Because they were all patented. Yeah, they were patented, but it's so pretty. So this is the original Tama, which is, the Tama series is actually from a, a place in Japan. But you know the story of this? A logger yeah. saw this flowering characteristic and saved it from being cut down for fuel, for firewood. Oh, wow. And then a bunch of nursery people went and propagated it and they propagated it to death but because it was propagated and circulated around the world the tama no tama no Ura still exists and then bobby green in fairhope alabama and nucio tom nucio bred with the seeds and and pollen of this and you get the whole tama series, series yeah. which i saw you have tama bambino we have bambino americana um Vino. We have Tama Vinos over there. That's one of Lib's favorites. I love Tama Vino. Because it's got that little white edge. Yes, and, and that's the characteristic of this camellia. So everybody on YouTube may not be a camellia nerd like we are, yeah. but the Tama series, the distinguishing characteristic is this super white edge. And yeah. some have thicker white margins than others. You know, for, for your your uh, watchers, I, I'm going to say that camellias may be the most underutilized plant. For the average gardener, here you, you get a plant that has great foliage, 
12 months out of the year. The, the Japonicas have a, an extremely long bloom season. Ours, as you alluded to a little bit earlier, you can get, you can extend the blooms on camellias for a lot. But in the Japonicas for us, the ones that are starting now, my jacks. Yes. Which is. The most exquisite. It's amazing and is well behaved, never gets huge. My jacks is starting now and it'll still be blooming in April. Absolutely. And what's there not to like about it? You know. I can't believe you already have one open. Wow. I don't think any of my jacks are blooming, but I do have quite a few camellias in flower. You know, and, and I point this plant out when I bring people through. I, I tell them, I said, to the average person, this is a great camellia because these are over 20 years old. They're not any bigger than this. Yeah. Um, many camellias are 20 years or twice the size. Yes, they're, they're trees. Yes, yeah. and this is well behaved, great foliage, great bloom. Uh, and the interesting thing about the Jack's Bloom, for those of you that haven't seen it, it actually sort of blooms in stages. It looks different when it, uh, when it starts out and unfolds into what seemingly is a different plant, but it's not. So you really get several different looks on, on the same plant. Everyone, I surely hope you've enjoyed part one of the video. And tune in tomorrow for part two. We're super excited to show you this entire garden. Truly magnificent. Your collection is beyond words. Oh, it's been fun. Well, thanks for watching everybody. And remember, tune in tomorrow for the second half of our tour here.